from the foundation of the world. Good morning. We're going to be in the book of James this morning. James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's called sometimes the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's one of those books that you can just turn to whenever you want to and just pick up in any chapter, any verse, just begin reading and, and glean something from it. It's likely one of the first books ever technically written of the New Testament when it comes to the timeline of when the authorship was. James is thought to be the half-brother of Jesus and a follower of his. And in this book, it's quite simple when it comes to the structure. You don't need really an introduction at all to it. You just open the book, turn there, and begin reading. But one of my favorite things to do is to try to pick up on patterns within Scripture. If you're looking for a way to change the way you read your Bible, I'm sure many of us have a schedule in which we begin hopefully each, each day or each week, to read something from Scripture. And for me, I know that repetition sometimes gets a little boring. I don't know if you are of that way or if you're just exhilarated whenever you read God's Word, which is a great thing. But for me, I need variation. I need to have something different to keep my attention and to stay focused. And one of the things that my brain does, whether I like it to or not, is to pick up on small little, little patterns that appear over time in Scripture. So one of my favorite things to do is when I'm reading a book and something stands out to be a very specific phrase or a word that's often used to try to figure out why that word is there, what it means, and if you connect some dots within your mind of all those different patterns that you see, something can be learned from it. So this morning what I want to do is talk about each time the book of James specifically talks about some, something that you're doing in which God calls you blessed. My mind immediately goes to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and he begins it with almost a poetic opening of blessed are the blank because blank. You have a whole litany of things that you can read that when you do these things, you shall be blessed. And that word blessing sometimes has the idea behind it of giving thanks, like when you bless the bread or bless the fruit of the vine for the Lord's Supper, we mean give thanks. But other times a bit more ambiguous. We're not quite sure what it means. Some people think that the idea of if you are blessed, then you are someone who is given some kind of special divine right or anointment if you do something. And sometimes that's true. Other times the word might be better rendered the idea of happy are you if you do a certain thing. So as we go through our text this morning, just three simple passages together, and we'll look at the idea of what we are called blessed if we do something in particular. Let's begin our conversation here in the book of James, chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, 12 through 16. You see it. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am be being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then uh, desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Now, this passage is quite simple. I'll give it to you that. It's a very simplistic rendering of what James wants us to know about the idea that we will be blessed if we endure temptation. Temptation was a very significant part of the teachings of Jesus when he was here on the earth. You think about immediately after Matthew chapter 3, you find, guess what? Matthew chapter 4. You all awake? Everybody? Okay. The temptation of Jesus directly after his baptism is a very significant moment in the life of Christ. In fact, when his disciples asked Jesus how they were to pray, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13, part of that was this. 
and do not lead us into temptation, talking to God, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I find it interesting that when Jesus was asked, how do we best communicate to God? How do we improve our prayer life with our Father in heaven? A huge portion of that towards the end was to be aware that temptation was being placed before us and that we should ask for God's help to avoid that temptation. Just think for a moment, if you have something that's very difficult that you struggle with in your life, you have a temptation placed in front of you, maybe even every day, instead of just thinking about that temptation, if you pause in that moment and mentally just ask God the Father to help you be aware to avoid that temptation, that momentary pause before just giving in, before just ruminating about what that temptation, that problem is for you, if you just pause and think about God, that gap really is a huge key in being aware that God sees us on the inside and what we do on the out. Uh, when teaching his disciples about what the other disciples would fall away, temptation was one of those things that drove people to fall away. Over in Luke chapter 8, Luke records the parable of the sower or the parable of the field or the parable of the soils, whatever version you want of that. There's that parable for us from the book of Luke chapter 8. And when explaining when that sower went forth to sow and he put seed on different types of ground, different types of soil, one of those explanations, Luke 8, 13 but the ones who fell on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy, and these have no root, for they believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. So it's a reality for us that when we are out there sowing the seed, Luke 8, 11, which is the word of God, sometimes we'll sow that seed, God will give the, uh, the increase, and people will receive and obey that word readily, but there's no root. There's no foundation. There's no protection from the elements of the sun, according to the parable. And that is someone who, when they are tempted to go back into sin, back to their old way of lifestyle, they will soon do so. If we look over into the Garden of Gethsemane, this is a moment in which we find Jesus towards the very last moments of his earthly existence before his crucifixion. He celebrates the Passover meal because he was Jewish. He remembers the Exodus story because he was there during all of that. And then he uses the bread that's present and the wine that's present to institute what we call the Lord's Supper, the remembrance of the body that was given for us and the blood that he would shed for our sins. They sung a hymn usually one of the psalms that they would chant before they would go out. And from that moment, Jesus knew his time was short here on the earth. So what he did to strengthen himself was to go to a garden, ironically, a garden, and then he would pray to his father for assistance, for help, to pour out his desire that he did not want this cup of suffering to come to him, and he always ended it with the idea, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And Luke chapter, I'm sorry, um, Matthew chapter 26, in verse 41, he has his three closest disciples, closest friends with him. And he's telling them this, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. What a true statement. Sometimes on the inside of us, our will, our desire is to do what God wants us to do. We say those things to him, we mean them, but sometimes our flesh is just weak. So asking God to help us through times of temptation is key. So what did James say about someone who endures temptation? Jumping back to our text in the book of James, chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, 
If you endure temptation, from verse 12, according to him, you are blessed. We will receive the crown of life when we are approved. That word approved there literally means the idea of passing a test or a trial. Something is put to trial before you. When you pass that test, this test is called life, by the way, you will receive that crown of life. Know from verse 13 that you are not being tempted by God. In fact, the tempter literally is Satan himself. And then verse 14, it's important to notice that when we are tempted in this life, we are not being tempted by God, but by the tempter. And we are tempted in part by our own desire. The word picture here is interesting. It gives us the idea that we are tempted by our own desire or lust and that we are enticed or lured. And the word there in the Greek is literally the idea of a lure that you would use for fishing. Now, I'm not a great fisherman. I've done a whole lot of it when I was a kid. And I knew you had to have the right bait to catch what you want. Now, I don't know about here in Macon, what you all do for bait around here, but we never had that synthetic stuff. We had that real bait. This works better, right? So we had squid. Do all use squid out here? You don't use squid? So a squid is a type of fish. No, I'm just kidding. We also had blood worms. Blood worms. You have that? You all got worms. That's good to know. So you have these worms, and we call these night crawlers, right? You have blood worms and night crawlers. These big old night crawlers would come out, and you get that big old juicy worm, delicious, right? And you chop it up, and you throw it on that hook, and you leave a little bit dangling off the end. That's how our tactic was anyway. It worked pretty well. So when you threw that line in, you had a hook on there, because otherwise it wouldn't be fishing. It'd just be boring, right? You got a hook on there, but you have the right kind of bait just wriggling off the hook. So when the fish, being dumb as he is, sees that lure and he takes a bite of that worm or squid or whatever you got, and he bites it, and guess what? The hook is right there. It's a dumb fish, isn't it? And yet, James, in the first century, used the exact same phraseology in the Greek, talk about us. What Satan does is puts a hook right out there, but hanging off that hook is a lure, a thing that we want, and we are enticed, and we are tempted, and that's the word picture from the book of James. And then verse 16, back to our text, it's possible to be deceived, believe it or not, about the idea and the origin of temptation. So one thing in the scriptures we find here in the book of James chapter 1 is we are blessed if we endure temptation. Would you believe it's not the only time that word blessed is used in James? Hopefully you should believe it because that's the whole point of why I'm here talking to you this very morning. If there's one time that word blessed is used, this would be a very short and boring sermon, right? Guess what? We have two. <laughs> James chapter 1, dropping down to verse 21 now. Somewhat of a different context here. James kind of is very fluid in the way he moves from topic to topic. So, no longer talking about temptation. Beginning in verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted or engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Second time that idea of deception is used here in this book. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect or complete law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So you will be blessed not only if you endure temptation, but also if you are doers of the word and doers of the work. Now, in verse 21, the beginning verse we began with, it begins with the word therefore. 
So the previous context builds the thoughts up until the point mentioned in verse 21. The previous context from verse 19, Know this, beloved brothers, that every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath or anger, because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all of those things. Now in this context, our human nature tells us that we are to act now and act fast. I don't have cable. I haven't had cable for, for many, many years. But I remember this one tagline for these notorious info sales. You're there and they are trying to get you to buy this knife that's better than any knife in your kitchen. It is so sharp and it is so cheap. Just 15 easy payments of $9.95. Act now, and you'll get 15 more of those knives. How do they make a profit? So the idea of acting fast, acting now, being always ready to do something is inherent within us. We have that impulse to be able to be impulsive, right? But James says, be slow to speak, slow to anger, but be quick to hear. And so putting away all of these things mentioned in verse 21 uh, it's not natural for us to lay those things aside because we have the impulsiveness of being human. He's saying, slow down, examine your life, examine what you're doing, and be able to act in a godly way. Therefore, verse 21, part A, lay aside your sin. And then 21, part B, receive the saving word. Now, this word mentioned here in verse 21, the implanted or the engrafted word, it's a very key idea of what that word does. If it's an implant, it's placed within you. If it's engrafted, it's grafted into the very fiber of your being. And that's the word of God. So the more of the word of God that we have as a part of us on the inside and on the out is going to be able to produce these fruits of the spirit. And hearing is a very a special part of that. No one knows the word of God inherently. We're not born and then we learn and then we experience. We've already known as the word of God. Someone has to be there to teach us. That's why the word of God is present. And for generation after generation, God has used his prophets and his authors of the scriptures to tell mankind what they need to know about the word of God. But it's very conditional. Just because someone told you about the word of God does not mean it will produce the desired effects in your life, right? If we look over verses 20 through, 22 through 24, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So again, the second time that idea of deception is involved here is being deceived, not about temptation, but being deceived about, well, I've heard the word of God, that's good enough. Sometimes it's really, really easy for us to know what to do, but to follow through and actually act out what God would have us to do is a bit more difficult. Verse, 22, uh, verse 23, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Now, for the longest time, I had the King James Version in front of me, and in the King James Version, the language is a little bit more difficult right so really the esv here helps me a ton to be able to understand exactly what james is talking about here looking in a glass darkly for example what in the world is he talking about a looking glass which is a mirror so here in the esv verse 23 if you're a hearer but not a doer you're like a guy who goes to the mirror in the morning and looks at his face has anyone this morning woken up got out of bed, and went to a mirror and looked at your face. Can you usually tell when you have or when you haven't, <laughs> right? The idea of looking at yourself in a mirror is a common thing that we hopefully all experience, right? If you have a nice salad that has some spinach in there, do you ever check out the mirror before you have a conversation with somebody else? Yeah, got some spinach right there in the front of your teeth. 
no doubt is waiting for you until after the conversation is over, you look at the mirror in your car, you go, I had a piece of spinach in my teeth this whole time. No wonder they wouldn't look at me right, right? So looking in a mirror, what James is saying here, if you're a hearer of the word, but you don't do it, you look at yourself in the mirror, you leave the mirror, and you immediately forget what in the world you look like. Sometimes that's a blessing. <laughs> now the meaning behind that is quite simple. What the word of God does for us is it shows us who we really are. The mirror is not going to lie about what that face looks like. <laughs> it's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your own personality, right? The Word of God shows you who you are on the outside by your actions, but also on the inside about those thoughts that you have, those secrets that you hold, those things that you don't tell anybody else. The Word of God says God knows about all that stuff, what you do, what you think, what your intentions are, all those things that we don't like to be revealed. So if you hear the Word of God, you see yourself, and then you walk away not doing the work, and you forget exactly who you were, because you want to forget exactly who you are. But someone who hears the word and does it, and then does the work on top of that, is someone who sees who they are in the mirror, and they work to become more Christ-like as they grow in the faith. Verse 25, the one who looks into the perfect law, the perfect law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Do you want to be blessed this morning? I saw one head nod and one yes. So hopefully the idea is yes. Being blessed is a good thing when it comes to the word of God. First thing is when temptation is placed before you. If you see that wriggly nightcrawler, in the water, right in front of your dumb fish face, <laughs> talking about myself here, you say, well, it looks pretty good. Don't bite that hook. Endure that temptation. You'll be blessed if you do so. If you want to be blessed, you also have to know that when the Word of God reveals what in your life doesn't look quite Christ-like, be willing to change. Hear the Word, do the work. And then finally... In the book of James, chapter 5. Let's turn there together. Chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and later rains, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, brothers, uh, brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, lest your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We are going to be blessed, therefore, if we are patient and we persevere to the end. Now, I am by no means a good runner. There are people in this world who enjoy the thing that we develop to run away from danger. They just enjoy it. They go out at another time of their day, they put on their running shoes, and they decide, you know what, I'm going to run. That is so ridiculous to me. <laughs> now, I'm terrible at it. Have you ever seen an image or a video of a giraffe running? <laughs> big old long neck, big old legs, and he's moving. I mean, he's not going fast, and it hurts every step of the way. That's me when I run. I just cannot run. My legs are too long. I don't have the endurance for it. I don't enjoy it, so I never run. I hate to do it. 
But the idea of being in a race and running the race is an analogy that God uses through Paul to talk about the Christian life. And I remember when I first began preaching, I got out of preaching school, I was at a congregation, and I was just ready to go. Didn't know what we were going to do, but we were going to do it now. And we had all these new ideas and concepts, and we had this one wise guy named Andy. And every now and again, Andy would just, in his own special way, pull me aside and just put his hand on my shoulder. He had this one line that stuck with me. It's not that profound, but I've never heard it before. And the profundity of it was this. <laughs> it's a marathon, not a sprint. The first time he said it, I was like, yep, okay, let's go right now. Let's get, he's like, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I was like, okay, whatever that means, let's do the work. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And what he was trying to instill in me was the idea of patience, perseverance, endurance. You are on fire right now. You've got a ton of ideas. It's a wonderful thing, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. And the Christian life is the exact same way. People in the first century, they were told the kingdom of heaven is at hand over and over and over and over again. And they were expecting something imminent. It got so bad that in Thessalonica, when the Christians heard the Lord is coming back, they sold all their stuff, they quit their jobs, and they're waiting around, looking up, waiting for him to come back. And we say, how nonsensical is that? But they were eager. They were ready. So the very first book of the New Testament penned talks about the idea of patience and perseverance. However long it takes for Christ to return, we should be working and be ready for that return. Over in the book of Acts chapter 1, let's turn there together. Let's talk about what we are patiently persevering towards. Well, it's the coming of the Lord. What in the world is that talking about? Well, Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, we call this the ascension. Acts 1, 9 now, when they had, he had spoken these things, while they watched, he, Jesus, was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, same Greek word, towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. We assume this to be angels. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven this same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. From our text, chapter 5, verse 8, the coming of the Lord is at hand. Verse 9, behold, the judge is standing at the door. It's like they're almost there at that imminent cusp of when Christ comes back. Now, in the reality, we know that Christ did not come back in the first century or the second, or the third, or even unto our century today. And yet that imminent idea of the judge being at the door is true in two senses. Either Christ does come back when we are alive. What a day that will be. <laughs> or we go on to him. We open the door through our death and meet the judge. Now, in this particular context... The idea of patiently persevering, we have some illustrations to show us how sensical it is for those that are living the Christian lifestyle to be patiently waiting. From chapter 5, verse 7 of our text, you have a farmer. You have a farmer. You have the early rain from October and November, and you have the latter rain from March and April. And he is waiting for those seeds that he planted to produce a crop that he can harvest, he can use, or he can sell. So a farmer has to wait a long time for the crop to be ready, is the idea. That's the idea of being patient. You also have the illustration of the prophets, all the people who lived under the Mosaic age, age and they wrote about what was coming in the future, what would happen in their lifetimes, they had to be patient to be able to write about the things of the future that they would never themselves get to experience. Do you know when Isaiah was written, for example? 
how many hundreds of years before the life of Christ? A thousand? Not quite. Seven hundred years. He's writing about the life, the betrayal, the death, and even the resurrection of Jesus who wouldn't be born for 700 years. Now, can you imagine just for a moment the patience it takes to write about this coming glory way off in the future? Meanwhile, suffering persecution and even a painful execution because the king doesn't like your message. Was he being patient? Absolutely he was. He had no choice. You also have a guy named Job. Now, Job is probably the earliest book of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And the story is pretty wild. The moral of the story, I suppose, from James' perspective is he had a lot of questions, didn't get a whole lot of answers, but the only thing he could do was patiently persevere to suffer through the suffering of Job to get to the end of his story. So James is saying, if you're someone finding it difficult to patiently persevere until the coming of the Lord, you are in good company. The farmer knows what you're experiencing. The prophets all knew what you were experiencing. Job lived through what you're experiencing. So you will be blessed if you patiently persevere. We're waiting for the Lord. We go over to Matthew chapter 25. I love to go through the entire chapter with you. Tempted to do it. But I'm getting some yawns. Maybe next week. I'll give you the ending. How about that? In Matthew 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Let's take a moment. Let's read it again. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Before this world was ever finished, quote unquote, there was a place that God prepared for those of us who are called blessed. James says if you want to be blessed, you need to endure temptation. When Satan puts that bait right in front of your face, don't fall for it. Instead, ask your father for help to endure that temptation. If you want to be blessed, you have to hear the word. But you also have to be a doer of the work. And finally, if you want to be blessed, if you want to inherit that kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world, you have to be willing to patiently persevere this life. This morning, the invitation is open to anyone to examine your own life and see where you stand in light of God's word. Have you heard the word? Have you obeyed it? Have you been willing to run that race? It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. If you need to obey the gospel this morning and put on Christ in baptism, or if you are a Christian who has fallen away in tempt into temptation, and you want to come back to God the Father this morning through prayer of repentance, please respond by coming forward as we stand and we sing.